Coming up on today's episode of the Aspiring Psychologist podcast, I talked to Dr. Marianne Trent about her journey from the NHS into her own private practice. We drop in to Marianne starting third year of her doctorate and we go through the journey into qualification through some years working in the NHS service as a qualified and then um, blended and eventually full-time into private practice. Talk a little bit about standardised ways of working, uh, the skills and knowledge, and also how it feels and what kind of person maybe would succeed in private practice. We cover a little bit of the pros and cons, including what um, both private and NHS can uh, potentially uniquely offer for clients. And we also finish with some uh, kind of big old reflections on the future. Word of warning, this episode is a little bit longer than usual, um, clocking in about an hour and 20 minutes, but obviously you can duck in and out of that um, at your leisure. So thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy it and see you soon. If you're looking to become a psychologist, then let this be your guide. This podcast at your side, you'll be on your way to being qualified. It's the Aspiring Psychologist Podcast with Dr. Marianne Trent. Hello, and welcome to the Aspiring Psychologist Podcast with Dr. Marianne Trent. But wait, I know what you're thinking. This isn't Dr. Marianne Trent. Who is this guy? Why is he here? And what's going on? Dear listener, worry not, allow me to explain. My name is Thomas Gawley and aside from lots of other things in my life, I'm also a trainee clinical psychologist. A few weeks ago, I was a guest on the podcast and Mary and I talked afterwards about topics for future episodes. I said I'd be really interested to hear an episode about working privately and Marianne's journey from the NHS into her own practice. Marianne agreed that this would make an interesting topic, but what might not be too interesting for listeners would be, in Marianne's own words, to listen to her waffle on to herself about her own career. Instead, she suggested that it would be far better to be interviewed herself. And so, the pyramid has been inverted, and the former podcast guest becomes the current podcast host. That's me. So, that's what we're going to do today, and I'm going to ask Marianne lots of questions about her journey kind of out of the declin into uh, her qualified career, and then her journey into uh, private practice, and we're going to uh, make some kind of general comparisons and maybe a few specific comparisons uh, about those two different uh, career paths. Uh, but first, uh, it's declin application season, of course, so we're all ready to go. Uh, one thing that we need to remind you of is that the Clearinghouse will contact your referees as soon as you save them on your application form. Uh, that means that they will be contacted before you even finish your application and submit it. So, quick note, make sure that you get consent from your referees before you add them uh, and save them on the form because Clearinghouse will take that um, as consent and that they're, they're okay to contact them. So, consent first and they will get contacted before you've submitted your form. So, without further ado, welcome to the Aspiring Psychologist podcast, not with Dr. Marianne Trent, but me, Thomas Gawley. And today's guest is none other than Dr. Marianne Trent. Hello, Marianne. How are you? Hi. I loved that. That's so fun. Thank you. Um, very, very pleased to be here, and I feel like I'm in very capable hands. Thanks. Good. Um, so I'm going to drop straight into it and I'm going to take you back to the start of your third year and final year of your doctoral training. Um, because I, I guess that the start of the third year is probably also the start of the end of the training and therefore maybe a time where trainees naturally start to think about what's going to happen post-qualification uh, and what kind of routes they want to take, maybe what services, maybe they're thinking about uh, what placements they might might have wanted during third year uh, and how that might lead into post-qualification or not. Um, so I guess to start, um, take us back to the start of third year. What, what were you doing and what were you thinking about post-qualification? Okay, great question. So um, 
in the course or on the course, should I say, that the that I did, um, the third year is broken up into two placements, two specialist placements that you really start to to pave the way for probably in year one, really. Um, and my first uh, specialist placement was um, in a wonderful, wonderful service that's since been disbanded, actually, unfortunately. Um, but it was a systemic and family therapy service um, offering some solution focus, but also, um, yeah, like there was proper sort of family therapy rooms in there. I don't know if you or anyone else have seen them, but they've got you know one way mirrors and, you know, um, phones that you can talk through and things like that. So it was in there. But then I also did some had some clients uh, for uh, yeah brief solution focus where you'd actually only offer appointments every four weeks, I think it was. So you're really setting kind of achievable, realistic targets and goals between sessions. But it was also a self referral service. It's like they were doing all of the really great stuff. And also once a week on a Wednesday lunchtime, they'd do a fat a drop in for any difficulties you were having um, I think it wasn't just linked to children, but often it would be children um, or parents that were brought in. I think it, I can't quite remember. I think it might have been a specific family support drop in. So literally, you could come half an hour before, give your name to reception, um, and then, um, you know, be seen for 20 minutes with a qualified psychologist to think through your difficulties and come up with a plan. And then as a result of that, the clinician who'd seen would then write an assessment report and send on any referrals that were needed. So you didn't hold that as a caseload. And if they wanted to be seen again, they could, but actually people didn't tend to. It was such a wonderful a wonderful way of working and I learned so much and you know not even knowing anything not other than someone's name before you see them I really learned how to to think on my feet and how to think about our core skills as um, psychologists and you know building rapport and trying to also probably interject when things are getting too content heavy to think actually we've only got 20 minutes if if by any chance, they were the only people that turned up, um, or there were other clinicians. There's, there was always other clinicians, but if it was a quiet time, then potentially you could go up to an hour. But really, the idea was that in that hour you were seeing three clients, um, and it was wonderful. So that was my placement there, um, and that was supervised by a clinical psychologist, and it was a, it was a very big team actually. And I think even trainee wise, there was. A trainee room up in the attic and it was um I think there was at different times of the week there was probably four or five of us so it was very busy but I learned a lot um, and then placement six was a dynamic placement um psychodynamic um brief brief dynamic interventions which was something I was very interested about in my first year um but actually as I developed my confidence um and just you just create new interests and new ways of being because I see placements as a way of trying on different stuff that fits and actually by the time placement six came I was much less interested in dynamic and probably you know I, I learned loads it was a great placement everyone was really lovely to me so I don't want to talk down that placement um, but certainly because of how long it takes to get into placement six my my interest for that were were less strong at that time and I haven't worked dynamically since but I guess what I love about our work is that the theory is all up there still and sometimes with our integrative way of working sometimes it will just fit and I can kind of weave in some more um, you know some more dynamic ways of working but of course alongside all of this um, you have a personal life as well don't you and you've got cohort stuff and you've got a thesis so there was a study block in between placement five and six um, where all sorts of things happen for context it's when um, William and Kate got married <laughs> that's that sort of time it's that long ago um, and that was the end of my that was the end of my study block I seem to recall because the rest of the world was watching the um, the wedding and I was beavering away on my laptop thesising so um, yeah my yeah, there was lots on my plate, but actually personally, I was incredibly fulfilled and happy. I'd been living in my new house, which is not this one, for um, for a year. And I'd been with my boyfriend, um, who is now my husband. We had met um, in the first two weeks of um, my 
year two study block I think so that's kind of yeah I started the course single and then went <laughs> went on the coupledom journey from year two but um yeah that's a very long answer to your question does that kind of does that answer it does that illuminate some of what was going on for me um yeah yeah it gives us gives us a good idea of um you know where where, where you're at um I'm I'm wondering of course that both of those placements I'm assuming um were in the NHS um as they tend to be although I'm aware that it's it is possible to arrange third year placements in on some courses um privately um so getting getting towards the end of your time on on the doctorate what what were you thinking about qualification what what um did you have a job secured before you'd finished? Um, as I'm aware, um, most trainees I've met um, have that lined up. Um, was that in the NHS? Um, and either way, what, what was it doing? Okay, so to set the context, we're talking about 2011 when I qualified. And um, due to some kind of financial shenanigans um, involving various banks and mortgage companies, um, including Northern Rock, which no longer exists, there was um, there was a recession um, which was in full swing at that time. It didn't feel as bleak as 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 the 2023 landscape actually, because we hadn't also had a global pandemic. But um, at that time, actually, there seemed to be cuts across services, and there were very very few jobs available. So, of my cohort of what started as 15 but finished as 16 due to kind of maternity leave shifts from the year above um only I think two people had qualified jobs to go to when the course ended in September 2011 um it started to wow. creep up um yeah yeah it started yeah, to creep up I, and... I guess that's unrecognizable that situation to, to trainees now where you might be the only person um interviewing for the job you might be the only person applying for the job um so yeah that's that's a big change um yeah I, I imagine to be honest, that, that it was finding the jobs to apply to was the problem mm -hmm. there just weren't any um you know quite often trainees might even get jobs in their final year you know sometimes services will wait you know almost a year for the right candidate but it was just like you know to begin with it was like Hmm, there's not really there's not really many jobs around, is there? Um, wonder where they're all hiding. Um, oh, I have got bills to pay. <laughs> like, hmm. Um, but actually, as it went, um, what happened is that basically, probably all of that cohort across the country began to widen their search. So I ended up in a role that was further away than any of my placements had been, even though um, the way placements are allocated, you know, I, I never got a placement that was like right near where I lived. Um, I think my shortest commute was 15 minutes. So uh, my longest during training was probably 50 minutes, but my qualified commute ended up being over an hour. Um, so all of us probably, yeah, as a, as a, as a, just as a whole graduate cohort across the country, probably widened our search for where we were willing to consider. Um, and really, because of the, the flavour of the work I'd done, I didn't really have any strong preference to a clinical population at that point. Um, but... I'd only worked, the majority of my work, including training, had been with adults. Um, and so nobody was more surprised <laughs> than me when I got a CAMS job um, in in basically the heart of Birmingham, but also Sutton Coalfield. And when I was told I was in Sutton Coalfield, I was like, oh, I've heard of Sutton Coalfield, but I don't know where it is. Um, so nobody was more surprised than that than me. But actually... I loved it and I made a great CAMS clinician. And what I really, really loved about CAMS was just how energetic and joy-filled the team were and how passionate about young people. And they were just really vibrant people, which might sound really strange, but um, when I was 
an aspiring psychologist and certainly when I was training it used to be said that if you go to um, this is a complete overgeneralization please don't be triggered by this anybody but this is kind of some of the just some of the in-house conversations if you go to a substance abuse conference um, as a professional the bar will be rammed um, you know and similarly if you're working in an in an adult service the clinician's might well have some of their own struggles. Whereas <laughs> so working in CAMS, everyone was just, yeah, at that point, just vibrant and, you know, really positive and optimistic in a way that was so refreshing, especially as that was my first qualified job. And it felt, it just felt really weird. <laughs> it felt really <laughs> weird. I think I've mentioned in the podcast before that I was, expecting and sort of kind of hoping for kid gloves that I'd have like a a period of transitioning to this new qualified role but my manager who I am now good friends with um she was basically like we've been waiting for you <laughs> and you're qualified away you go and I think that was empowering so they were thinking of me as qualified I mean in terms of um I don't know if CAPA still exists but a choice and partnership approach that's how the service worked and it worked beautifully and it had won awards for patient safety it was a great service um but in terms of how it works with kappa is that you don't suddenly get like 15 cases given to you it builds week by week so that did allow me to have more time to think to plan to you know make sure my notice board next to my desk looked nice all those things but it meant that I wasn't suddenly swamped with with activities so I did get to grow into that role whereas I think still some services might have been tempted to you know you're new have this and then juggle your new client that comes in three weeks out of four um but that didn't happen so I was thankful for that but I was just a qualified member of staff and expected to to roll with it yeah um I, I, I'm obviously being at the stage of my career I'm at I'm kind of focused on the transition uh onto the doctorate but yeah I'm also aware that there's there's been another another big transition, and I, I know a former supervisor of mine uh, talked about uh, about that transition in supervision, and and ca- kind of described it as being, you know, where where before you're qualified, you you don't have ultimate clinical responsibility because you have a supervisor who is responsible for you ultimately, you know. Um, and he said, you know, in kind of getting registered after he'd qualified, he'd gone from the Friday having no ultimate clinical responsibility to Monday, suddenly it's all on him. And, uh, you know, he's got assistant uh, as well. So, um, yeah, I can, uh, I can imagine that's a, a difficult transition to, uh, uh, to make. Um, but you've made that transition and you've gone into your qualified role. So I'm, I'm wondering how long were you at that CAMS uh, uh, service for? And, and I suppose where where did the where did the journey into your own practice begin both in your in your mind or your ambition uh, was it something that you, that you were planning to do or was it something that just kind of emerged um yeah how did how did that come about okay so i was there almost 4 years but that did include one little maternity leave um and a wedding <laughs> and all the hen shenanigans that went with that um So, yeah, I wasn't planning on doing private work. So before I um, before I got my qualified job, I did do some brief project work um, for organizations, which was basically sort of using my research skills um, and trying to kind of put together a, a report for an organization, which I did really enjoy. Um, but to be honest, the idea for private work wasn't my own. <laughs> it was um, it was offered to me as an idea uh, by my husband. Um, so um, my, I'd had a second um, lot of maternity leave when I was working in an adult service so I left that cam service to come to a, an adult service that was closer to home um, and again really really valued my time there and I learned so much and that's when I became a trauma specialist is what I would say um, 
and I miss my colleagues. I do, I do, I do. Um, so, and I miss my colleagues in CAMS as well, <laughs> you know, but you can keep them as friends once you leave is what I'd say. Um, so, um, my youngest was starting um, preschool at the school um, and I was only by that stage working three days a week. So after my first maternity leave, I went back to the CAM service four days a week. And then when I um, when I went back from my maternity leave for the adult service, I decided I only wanted to be three because as anybody who works four days will tell you, you're basically doing five days work in four, four less pay. Um, so I wanted to absolutely be part time. Um, and so, yeah, it does is a bit of a shock when your wages go down. Um, but you have to kind of cut, cut your cloth accordingly is what um, is what my my parents would have told me. Um, so I had those two days with um, with my um, well, being a parent and doing all of the school run bits and pieces for the eldest. But then when the youngest was going to be starting preschool, my husband was like, well, what are you going to do with those three hours a week um, on a Wednesday and a Thursday? And I was like, I don't know, maybe have a nap, <laughs> maybe have a facial, <laughs> tidy the house. And he was like, you could start some private work. And I was like, oh, well, I could. But I didn't feel like a proper enough psychologist I don't think it felt like I needed to be some I don't know something different <laughs> and I didn't feel like I was it um but I was oh yeah, well yeah maybe some more money would be nice um you know yeah. ugh, I don't know so um I was part of a of a psychologist network for private professionals and I'd been part of it probably for a year so I knew it was possible and one of my good friends um Cara I know she won't mind me, mind me mentioning her she was already working in private and had done for quite some time and she was like you'd be fabulous at it just you know do it do it so um to cut a very long story short um I found myself two clinics one that had space on a Wednesday one that had space on a Thursday that were traveling distance from my children's school so that I could drop them off for 8 45 <laughs> and then hot foot it by car to the clinic and then see two clients um and then hot foot it back to the school to pick up my youngest just in time so um that was quite an action-packed three hours um it really was but then the pandemic happened um so I'd started that in September 2019 and then by the time March came around obviously it all shifted online and then I didn't have the school run to worry about so I increased it to three clients because there was increased demand because of the pandemic and then randomly ended up setting up an evening clinic one evening a week so before I knew it I was then doing eight sessions a week and I was so terrified of not getting the tax right that I saved every single penny um, other than um, my costs and my overheads um, for, you know, software and, you know, ICO, um, all yeah. of the uh, insurance, all, all of that jazz, um, yeah. because I, I didn't want to then suddenly not have enough money. So it got to a position where I was like, oh, I'm going to be a higher rate taxpayer before too long. I am working, <laughs> working myself yeah. to the bone for actually no benefit. Um, and so it just made me think, well, could I shift the balance slightly? Could I maybe do two days in the NHS and then have um, three days in private practice? And, you know, the pandemic um, kind of was resolving itself. The kids are back at school. Um, and by the time I actually went all in self-employed, it was April 2021 because my request to drop down had been declined um, and it was interesting that sometimes um, when we might get what we want we might realize it's not what we want um, and it was actually as I was doing my appeal for that that I suddenly realized if they say yes I think I might be a bit disappointed I might be a bit sad. Um, and I think that that speaks volumes, doesn't it? Because if you then get what you want and you still don't want it, maybe that's not what, you know, that's not the course of action you should be taking. So I did then make the decision to go all in, which is, you know, not an easy decision. So someone on my cohort 
had always planned to be a trainee and then set up their own practice and that is what they did um, right from the beginning and to watch that going on as someone that was newly qualified it was like oh gosh that feels like oh wild you know they had a website and everything um so to to kind of go through that process myself but but know I already could pay my bills if needed you know I got my my, my accountant to help me calculate what what I needed as a bare minimum um, to kind of make my ends meet and still pay my tax and my national insurance and all of that jazz and to actually take out um, any passive assets at that time. So by that time, I did have the Tricky Brain Kit and the Grief Collective book and a couple of different bits and pieces. Um, but if we took that out, it's not as predictable as regular one-to-one -one client work. So we took that off the table and kind of helped me have a figure for how many clients I needed to see a week. So that's where I started um, but it still feels like a big deal. Um, and I would say that I never felt alone. So people were like, won't you be lonely? But actually, my accountant is so lovely. She feels like part of my team. Um, and I've got a virtual assistant, Hannah, who helps me do bits and pieces for socials and keeps me on track and thinking, I haven't got any content planned. I haven't got any content planned. What are you going to do? Um, and so and at that time, we were running regular five-day challenges for people with complex trauma. And so, um, yeah, I think Hannah and I were doing more work together at that time because there's lots involved in running a challenge. Um, so I never felt by myself I've never felt lonely um, and of course when you're seeing clients you are connecting with people and I have done some networking here and there and I'm part of various groups but you know I still talk to Cara most days um, and other kind of psychologist friends as well so yeah that's a very long answer to your question again but that's that's what happened um, I'm just gonna gonna take that um the, the kind of you don't feel lonely but um you also mentioned during the camp that, that you really missed the people you worked with in, in the services as well. Um, and I know from my, from my own experience, I, I feel like part of my um, continuous development has happened in kind of what are kind of informal micro supervisions, just these passing conversations or um, in my role as an AP I was really fortunate that we ha always had two trainees um, in the team and we we had a had our own room um, and they would they would come in from a session and they'd be you know quite often they'd be everyone would turn their chairs around and they'd be like a little kind of debrief and start, sort of sharing ideas um, we also did a, a balance group as well every month with the whole team which would be maybe six of us um, so for anyone who doesn't know what a balance group is, it's a, a basically a case discussion uh, that's unprepared. So one person presents a case, generally something that they're really stuck with, and that can be either with a client or working with another team or working with a system, but something where they're stuck and, and the progress of the work is is kind of uh, become difficult. Um, they present that for How 10 minutes. How do you spell that, Thomas? I've not heard of that before. Is it B? Balance? It's B. B A L I N T. I think it's named after a psychologist. So it comes from the around the mid century. I think uh, it was a group of psychologists who um, who created this group in order to kind of have have supervision and, and share ideas uh, and develop their their thinking. Um, it's really yeah. It's a really good learning session. I always I always felt. Um, I, I think I generally I, I felt kind of perceptibly developed as a clinician after each one of those sessions um, but in terms of just those informal little chats that that kind of go on they're, they're, there's a kind of drip um drip drip effect of of development through those so i'm wondering you know when you're saying you miss the services do you <clears throat> how do you how do you compensate <clears throat> by what by working as a kind of lone private clinician how do, how do you compensate for that yeah, good question. I'm very perceptive even if you should notice what I'd said and then there being a bit of a disparity there. So um, it's very tricky because in my CAM service, I had my own office. And if you're busy, you can shut the door, <laughs> um, which is quite quite clear communication, isn't it? 
Um, whereas in my um, adult service, I didn't even have my own chair. So it was agile working, but in an environment where there wasn't even really room for all the clinicians that were there. Um, but at that point, they weren't that hot on you working from home until the pandemic happened. And then obviously, everything became deathly quiet. Um, but I have always, in my qualified capacity and in my assistant and aspiring capacity, been a real grafter. I will, you know, I will take on cases. I will fill my caseload. We used to work with a job plan model as part of CAPA. And that's something that's followed me through my career and I still have now. So I was recruited to the 8A post um, in adults to do 50% face-to-face clinical time. And when I started, I was sort of told by another clinician, oh, it's not possible because you can't get the rooms. Um, you know, you just can't see people. I've only seen probably one or two people this year um, because you can't get the rooms because the rooms were given out to people all across the trust, not just to the people that worked in the building, which again, I think needed <laughs> reworking. Um, so I was like, well, I've been employed to do face-to-face time. I'm going to do it. Um, so I went all over the city getting rooms. So I wasn't always there, you know. So when I saw people, it was a really nice connection time. Um, and actually, in my first year of working there, um, I only was at base on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, that's the only time that I had to connect with people. So um, I was used to lots of my time with my colleagues being via WhatsApp (laughs) or text message or emails. So um, actually working now in isolation, it doesn't feel hugely different. Does that make sense? So it it did when I went back from my second maternity leave, I have only got two kids, it did, I was careful to give myself more time um, with my colleagues and I've always really loved uh, working with aspiring psychologists so I loved spending time with trainees Um, I loved spending time with assistants and I've been able to obviously weave that into my current working model so that I'm still getting that aspect of something that I really enjoyed and that I was good at as well Um, and of course I've still got supervisors so I've got a supervisor for my EMDR work And I've got a supervisor for my generic practice, not specifically linked to EMDR. And there's a mixture of ages there as well. So um, my generic supervisor is an um, an a man in advancing age, um, and I really love his just his view on things, and that we do have different personal experiences and professional experiences and what he brings to that but um yeah so you know I am still in contact with people and because I've moved more into I would now call myself a businesswoman as well as a psychologist and actually a few years ago that would have made me sick in my mouth um because it I wasn't comfortable with that with that idea because I've now moved into those networks I'm also kind of you know, making contacts in the business world as well. And I'm feeling kind of, yeah, that they're my colleagues as well. So it is, you know, I do do some networking in person and I do do some networking events. um, And I'm just freshly back from Galway doing a keynote speech in person. Um, But for me, I like my own company. I think I'm quite good company. I have I have excellent choice in activities that I always like to do. Um, so, <laughs> and I always say yes to. Um, I am good company, and I I'm all right with silence. Um, and yeah, I like Radio Two as company. So, and it might sound like a really washy, wishy washy answer. And solo private practice working remotely will not work for everybody. But for me. It works really well and it helps me to be more available for my children so that they've got mummy um, picking them up and dropping them off, you know, nine times a week. So we're meeting quite early on a Friday because this is the day this is the day I don't do it. Um, but it just it just suits my work life balance and it suits me and it suits my clients and it works for me, but it might not work for everybody. Mm. 
Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, you say you say wishy washy, but you've you've actually made me. I, I, I was starting to think about the, the 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 triangle of supervision. So, for anybody who's not aware of this, it's a kind of um, a model for supervision um, on which to uh, structure your thinking around supervision and also uh, supervision sessions. Um, and on that triangle, we have normative, formative, and restorative, and these are the three aspects that you might want to think about covering. Um, uh, overall during your supervision. Uh, normative obviously being about uh, standardized ways of working, shared shared ways of working, um, formative being kind of skills and knowledge, and then restorative being more about you as a person um, and how things have felt um, either within a case or just, uh, just generally. Um, and I think in the answer actually you managed to kind of go around all, um, all three of those uh, points. You know, you talked about supervision and CPD, but also uh, some new skills so like business skills and keynote speaking and also like the type of person um that you are so you're you're happy being by yourself but you're also happy with company but also yeah that it that it works for you kind of on a on a personal level um so i'm just gonna let's do another quick lap of that triangle as well um so in terms of the normative Things. So the standardized ways of working as a private clinician compared to working in the NHS. Um, what what things what things do you need that are kind of standardized? So things like um, in, insurance. Do you need business insurance? Do you need insurance to cover you in case something goes uh, wrong with a client um, that you are responsible for? Um, are there um, yeah, are there, uh, in terms of, I know that you, you work online, but what kind of like clinic space do you need? How, how do you get that? How much does it cost? You know, um, all, all of those kind of things. Do you share one with other private clinicians? So, um, okay. yeah, do you want to just, do you just want to do a quick lap of the, the normative section of that plan? Sure, <clears throat> absolutely. So um, it's probably also worth saying that on the morning of my first ever private clinic, I was standing in my kitchen crying. <laughs> because I just didn't feel right. enough. I just didn't. I, I was. I would say I was more nervous than my first day working qualified. More nervous. I. I don't remember being nervous when I was starting training because I didn't have time. I just got back from India as well. Um, more nervous than my first assistant job. I think it's more nervous. Probably as nervous as I was on on my Viva day. Really, like it was. I just ugh, felt awful. And the idea of asking someone for money for what I did that felt like common sense. I think that's the thing. We get so schooled into what we're doing that the idea of actually being paid more than you know, 22 pounds an hour or whatever it was that we're on at the time, um, it felt it felt like I was robbing a bank. It felt like I was doing something really, really naughty. But actually, and I felt like I needed to be able to give extra, do more to earn that money because I was so institutionalized by being an employee. Um, I would say that certainly initially the work was easier um, than than the NHS work I'd been doing. Um, and very quickly I was like, oh, <laughs> oh yeah, it's fine. <laughs> it's all right. Um, so, yeah, you do need to register with the Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO. I mentioned those earlier, but I didn't give you the full, <laughs> the full details about what ICO was. Um, and you need to have processes set up for kind of your GDPR, how you're going to keep notes, all of that jazz. Mine's all electronic. Um, and you need and to <clears throat> have indemnity mean, insurance. Sorry, does that mean, does that, mean that you in, – so in the NHS, we, you know, we – are ardent note takers and we can be audited um, and in fact patients can access their own records and their progress notes it's it's information that um, is kind of right rightfully theirs um, so I'm assuming that means that that's that's the same working privately but there's a different um, slightly different process in which you have to hold that data um, but also make it aud auditable is it auditable by the HCPC so yeah the HCPC at any time could contact you and tell you that you've been selected for audit. Um, the, the, the clinical platform I use makes it all quite easy to kind of to download and share notes if if and when required. And of course, so clients still like they can in the NHS request access to their notes, but 
largely speaking, they don't tend to unless it's some legal funded work or something. Um, but yeah, it's still still absolutely the process. And you do need to have an indemnity insurance. But actually, I would suggest to anyone listening to this, um, perhaps even when working at trainee level, um, perhaps even before that, to consider insurance anyway. It's not a fortune. It's probably £150 a year for, for a level that's reasonable cover. Um, because I would say that the NHS will cover you, um, you know, in an unlimited capacity, I believe, but only if you followed the right procedures and processes. So if it's found that you haven't, you're going to be liable, um, which I don't think they always, you know, they don't always tell you. So if you had your own, in, you know, like you're about to be a little bit sick, Thomas, <laughs> if you have your own cover, then you're covered regardless. And it just feels like a little bit of immunity. Um, so, yeah, I would say for anyone listening to this, if you're working um, in a clinical setting to consider getting your own um, your own indemnity insurance. And there's a variety of providers. I use Oxygen, there's Towergate, there's, there's a few others as well. But I think they're all standardised pricing, you know, a bit of a price fix situation, but um, just something to make you feel a little bit more confident. Because with the best one in the world, sometimes you may not do clinical notes within 48 hours or whatever it is that your trust wants, which then would not be you following procedures. So it might be potentially something as small as that that might lead you to standing on a stand in, you know, speaking to your honour. Um, and all of us have been there. All of us have been there where mm. we haven't met the targets. We haven't perhaps done what we should have done. You know, if you've maybe let your, you know, what's it called, that training that you have to do, mandatory training, um, if you've somehow let a bit of that lapse, then technically you're not you're not compliant with trust regulations and and requirements. So, yeah, um, I would look at um, some sort of indemnity cover um, wherever you are. Um, initially, I was doing all of my private work in the clinic settings, and the prices for that will absolutely vary depending on which part of the country you're in. I was paying twenty five pounds for. Um, for the two hours that I needed. So technically, I could have wanged in an extra client if I'd had the space, um, if I'd had the time and no time limits, because they tend to do it in half days. So people don't often want you to do ad hoc hours here and there. They, they will want to look for, for something a bit bigger and more consistent. But, um, you know, that said, even on Harley Street, I've seen that you can get therapy rooms for as little as like 12, 13 pounds an hour. So please don't be daunted by anyone that you see talking about themselves as a Harley Street therapist, because it's not, it just doesn't mean what you think it might mean, you know? Mm. Um, so yeah, there's, there's quite a few steps and stages to, to, to overcome initially, but actually it's just that all of those steps and stages have been done for you if you've been employed before um, and now you're responsible for it yourself. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's not, it doesn't need to be as daunting as you think it might be. And connecting with other professionals who've been through that can be really useful too. It might be worth saying, I've also got um, a webinar, a masterclass on considering going all in self-employed. So if anyone's interested in checking that out, they can check out the details in the show notes. How about, so so that's the kind of the the, the kind of normative way. And I, I, I'm, I suppose within that, actually, there, there seem to be some some new skills as well that are unique therefore to, to working privately like you know organizing these things a lot of kind of admin but also learning about you know the limits of <clears throat> uh, potential limits of, of indemnity insurance when it comes to working for a, a big organization which I for one didn't know so thanks for that pro tip um, I'm going to look into that um, that's not to say that I, I don't always work within a protocol I try to but sometimes yeah maybe I'm not even aware um, in the moment, whether whether I am or whether I'm not. For example, if you, if you if you suddenly went home sick and you just weren't well enough, you might easily forget to do your clinical notes or, you know, not do them for a week or so, you know? Um, and that's just part of being human. But technically, you know, it might be that if something happened to that client and the team weren't aware that, that we've fallen foul of the trust procedures there and they might be like, well, you know, we told you to do your clinical notes within 48 hours. It's a, it's a small example, but but one to be aware yeah. of, I think, for sure. Yeah. Um, you touched briefly on 
working privately uh, as as it working for you it's kind of on a personal level <clears throat> but without wanting to kind of ask about um, your personal life um, but I would like to know what kind of person do you think would succeed in private practice or in or in blenders maybe part-time NHS part-time practice or even full full-time private what is there is there is the type of person who is maybe more more geared towards succeeding in in that in that setting I would say no absolutely and you know it might be the, the question might be are you more driven by money than any other clinician that might be part of the yeah. question you know um and I guess when we look at our own stories um and our own relationship with money there can be money trauma you know so um growing up at different times there's been money in my family and no money in my family you know there's been times where my parents were having to shop in netto um and only buy tesco value food that's kind of the era that i was growing that i grew up in um where you had to go to school with you know blue and white striped crisps you know which was like the worst thing imaginable um, because everyone's like oh value value um you know and I guess the worst thing is no crisps at all isn't it because then you can't afford crisps at all but um yeah there's been times when there's been more money and less money but my mum's always her mantra has always been look after the pennies and the pounds look after themselves and if we were ever going out for lunch if I didn't choose egg, sa egg sandwich I'd be like <laughs> <laughs> like I was made out to be a millionaire because egg is traditionally the cheapest in any sandwich um, in any shop because it's so cheap um, so yeah I was always taught to be quite frugal and that earning money is is good um, so yeah I do like earning money I've always earned money so even when I was 13 I was working selling uh, magazines that were called Candice I think they are still around I wrote for it recently um, and then I, my brother broke his leg and I ended up doing his paper round. Um, and then um, I ended up working, washing up in a hotel and then I worked for Boots. And so I was always used to working and enjoying that and feeling like I got a sense of satisfaction from having my own money. But then growing up in a family where my mum had always worked and had her own money as well. So, you know, that was just the way that for me, grew up as normal, that you have your own bank account, you can do what you want to do. You might also have a joint a joint account when you're when you're married as well. But um, being able to look after myself and be independent, um, have my own car. And so I needed to be able to earn enough to to do, you know, I have a, I've got a 10 year old car, Thomas, you know, it's I'm not I'm not extravagant as a person. This necklace <clears throat> came from a charity shop, you know, um, I'm not extravagant, but I want to be able to afford the things I want to be able to afford. Um, and yeah, you know, I don't work as many hours as you might assume. So you might be like, oh, well, she's in private practice. Um, you know, probably she sees as many clients as she did in the NHS. She's probably a high rate taxpayer. She's probably absolutely milking it, especially with everything else she's got going on. I'm not. Uh, I'm not a higher rate taxpayer as yet. Um, I only want to see nine clients a week um three mornings a week because otherwise I will be depleted you know I won't be as good for those clients if I was seeing 20 a week I wouldn't have enough in the tank um so I balance myself um I go to personal training twice a week which again I know is 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 quite extravagant but I pay 25 pounds a session and it does so much for me um so I'd go on a Wednesday lunchtime and a Friday morning um because that helps me build exercise into my week into my work week rather than trying to tack it on um, and again I know that's a luxury not available to everybody but um yeah do you need to be a, a particular type of person you need to be able to give yourself permission to earn money and to do that transaction between yourself and a client you know and if you're working in a um, in a face-to-face -face setting there might be reception that can handle that for you if you don't want to do that not all clinicians want to to handle the money or do the contracting and all of that jazz my contracting is largely done remotely um, it's done 
via the platform you know so you, expl you explain your terms and conditions but then you send them and they're all sort of sorted out that way but um you have to give yourself permission to earn money you know some people do set themselves up as um cic community interest companies if the, you know if they want to do that but i am okay with making a profit and charging for my time and even you know with the aspiring psychologist podcast i do have these free resources i do have the free q and a's but if people have the resources and have the will there's other ways of working with me as well which are not free they're great value i still think but i know some people are a bit, are a bit like hmm, charging money for that but it takes me hours and hours and hours and hours and hours even to do podcast episodes you know even to edit them even to to schedule everything it costs me money to do all of this even the platform we're streaming on and the platform that the podcast is then hosted on you know it's not free um and the stuff with the membership again that's not free i pay all of my experts within that so i, I know it might it, you know and even people saying oh you've taken the nhs training and now you're not even working for them for some people that feels like something they don't want to do or can't can't allow themselves to do um but i feel like i've been exceptional value for the nhs and that i still you know in essence do some nhs work in helping support aspiring psychologists and supporting the well-being of the country when i do different bits and pieces as well so you have to be able to give yourself permission to earn money in a way that might look different than it was if you were salaried um i've not always been this out there with with the stuff that I do um that's come with time you have to what you what you very quickly learn is that people aren't necessarily going to come flooding to you knocking on your door wanting to ask to give you money you have to be okay with putting yourself out there and discussing the things that you have that are available for people to to spend money on and that is a transition period you know um even my mum on my social, she was like, oh, you like talking about yourself, don't you? <laughs> so, I'm a businesswoman. You have to do that, you know. And that's a comfortability curve, I would say. Um, and that will just come with time. And if you want to funnel more money into paid for advertising with different platforms to get your um, you know, your one-to-one -one clients, that's a possibility. I don't struggle for one-to-one -one clients. They're always, you know, fairly consistently available at, at the level that I want them. Um, so, you know, so I, I advertise on psychology today, um, which keeps things kind of trickling in. But I think, I don't know, I, I don't actually ask my clients where they hear about me from. I perhaps should start to. Um, yeah, I feel like all of my answers to your questions are very rambling, Tom. No, 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 not not at all. Um, and in fact, I was that that's kind of covered a lot a lot of what I was going to ask about next in terms of the the kind of maybe the pros and cons between working privately or working for the NHS. Um, and yeah, one of those things is is the, the financial implications. So um, on the on the face of it, I'm, I mean, I'm sure most most listeners have had a had a look at private psychologists websites and seen that their fees and um they seem to be depending on on whereabouts in the country they are i'm going to exclude london um you know somewhere between 80 and 150 pounds an hour we all know we're not um getting paid that at band seven but of course there are um cost implications as well um there's no pension um either which is um uh, renowned in the nhs um costs like insurance costs like uh clinic hire um so i suppose just very quickly do you do those do those do those costs and um earnings kind of balance out to make it worth worthwhile it's probably worth saying that until about four months ago even with me working what i consider in a really <laughs> diverse way and really hard, I was still only paying myself what I got from the NHS for working three days a week. Okay. So do, do you have moments where you think, you know, I could, it would be nice just to rock up eight till four a, a service, do my work and just, and then just go home? No, not anymore. 
I think I'd got myself to a position where I was unemployable <laughs> um, because I would no, I would say okay. no. Um, it got to a position where I was probably, probably verging on being unemployable. I was so energized for everything that I had going on and learning about um, how to serve clients better and how to to do it more to do it quicker with less of the loopholes that were involved which was the things I found really frustrating about um, employed life um, and um, you know just thinking about I know learning about funnels and things like that um, for kind of how to get clients on board for you know working with me and stuff I was just I was going private at the point where there was a platform called Clubhouse I think it is still around but it's not not around as much and it, it was launched at a time that allowed it to just go wild so it was launched at a time just in the pandemic when everyone was home everyone was stuck people were just really receptive to be able to listen to this kind of live streaming of business experts basically um and I just lapped all that up I was really really energized by that so it got to the position where when I was at work I wanted to be working on my socials or doing X, Y, and Z or writing a book or, you know, and so, it, and I wasn't, of course I wasn't, that would be really unfair, but it got to the stage where I felt like I was having an affair, you know, that it, I would rather be somewhere else. And so that really helped to make my decision. And I just think, and now I'm so used to doing what I want to do when I want to do it, I would find employed life quite constraining. Okay. So we've talked a lot about um, about work, working privately from the perspective of the, the psychologist and how, how the journey goes into it and the kind of various pros and cons, the various different ways of working and things that you need to consider and maybe the things you need to be um, and embody. Um, but I really want to give a bit of time and a bit of space to the clients as well. Um, and kind of ask you about your thoughts on what the private sector can uniquely offer clients. What what does because I'm I'm aware that they, they they could become a kind of us versus them in terms of NHS versus private, but they they both exist um, for for a reason, and they do both offer perhaps unique things that the other the other way can't can't offer. Um, or way, ways of working that that can't be done. Um, so yeah, what do you what do you think the private sector generally for for psychology can can uniquely offer clients and why? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good question. So I would say the primary and possibly even one of the only benefits um, is there might be zero weights. And I know that um, we speak to each other as of yesterday when record NHS weights, certainly for physical health, were announced as up to two years. Um, and that's not uncommon in mental health services as well. So, um, you know, currently, usually if someone emails me, they can usually be seen at least for an initial assessment, if not necessarily a regular weekly slot, slot but certainly fortnightly to go uh, weekly if they want to within a couple of weeks. And that's often just not heard of um, in a NHS services currently. I wish it was. Uh, and that was something that I was absolutely trying to sort out. So when I was um, going on my second maternity leave, I got the weights from the service down from two and a half years to six months because of the way I was working, because of that face-to-face that I was offering 50%. Um, and unfortunately, by the time I got back to the service, it had it had gone up again. And we never quite recovered from that, perhaps because I was working three days a week rather than four. Um, but that for me is an advantage. But in terms of the level of expertise available in the NHS and the level of passion and care and commitment, I would say that is second to none. You know, people in the NHS that I work with, care so deeply about the clients they work with on, on the whole. Um, I think 
because I was doing the majority of the assessments in the service I was most recently working at, I was holding the client stories in my head. They weren't just names, they were people. And that was that was difficult because having to say goodbye to people I'd never get to meet, you know, in my head I'd assess them and they were never going to come to the top of the waiting list. Whereas often when I'd meet people, they'd be like, oh, I hope I get to work with you. And often they did because I saw lots and lots of people. So letting that service go and letting those clients go, but, um, you know, letting those really professional established clinicians out of my day-to-day radar and um yeah like the cross-professional working that you work with you know that's that's unique isn't it you know even the informal conversations you're able to have in an employee capacity that then have a cost attached for the client if they want that um outside of that but often people have got practices that have got even private practice have got multi kind of discipline approaches, but I've got people that I can work with informally and kind of ad hoc here and there. But in terms of the full MDT meeting and the case discussion and stuff, clients aren't necessarily going to get that, but often the type of clients we're working with don't need that anyway. Um, And one of the other key benefits other than waiting times is, is session number. So sometimes I'm working with a client and I will actually say to them, if, if we were working in the NHS, you wouldn't meet the criteria for for this service and it's so it's a lower level of intervention but they want it from a specialist rather than someone that could actually probably do some of the work in a more junior capacity and they want to know that they've got that for as long as they need to and that if they want to they can dip back in a month if they want to they can check back in in six months do you see what I mean so they've got more freedom they've got more control but private work is not always self-funded private work might be legal funded it might be um, some of my favorite clients to work with are actually those that are covered by their own occupational health cover plans Um, and that feels a bit more like NHS type working actually so um, even though those contracts are less lucrative um, I do enjoy the work for them you know for the type of clients that I pick up from there. Mm. Um, Yeah that's that's really interesting in terms of the, the kind of the MDT working that you can that you can still access that um but yeah given um given that you said no not many of your clients require that but it's 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 useful to know i think because that's one of my you know one of the one of the 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 images of my mind of being in a, a clinic with multiple different teams to going to working you know in a garden shed it's it does it does seem like there's there's suddenly you you're really on your own and so it's good to know that um that that can still be uh, transferable. What do you think? So, well, just to speak to that to the point where you're working with less complex clients. So, what I know in NHS services is often you're working with clients sometimes who really need to be in an inpatient setting because they're really not well. They're not thriving. Whereas I wouldn't necessarily work with clients at that level of crisis in private practice that would feel unsafe that would feel risky for me and for the client so I think Mm. I'm working with complex but not um not actively in crisis clients if that makes sense yeah absolutely and it and it sounds also the what you're saying about the the kind of the amount of sessions and yeah I'm aware in the NHS um, there's generally a kind of commission to do a, a certain amount of sessions especially when it comes to things like CBT um, and that of course is, is kind of evidence-based um, uh, limit on sessions that you know um, I think it's within six sessions you get your most effects and then it kind of plateaus so I suppose in terms of commissioning and resource um, if the evidence says that you know uh, 12 or more sessions you you just plateau then um, you shouldn't really be commissioning more than 12 sessions but it, what it does do I suppose in in the private setting is give clients the control over how much they um, they want um, obviously notwithstanding the fact that that is a collaborative conversation about um, whether they they need it um, as well um, but it certainly seems a bit a bit more kind of control and discussion at, around that which which is good I also wonder about population groups as well who might not access mainstream services in the NHS. Not that they can't, but that they wouldn't. Um, one of the things that um, I'm particularly interested in is um, elite football. Um, 
we don't have time to go into that. But there are many clinical um, presentations going on and, and some clinical issues in elite football. But you wouldn't necessarily see an England footballer sat in an NHS waiting room. Um, so, I, you know, pe people who live, who live and work in a world which is very structured, like elite football or like the military, might not find their way to an NHS mainstream service. So there's perhaps potential population groups who, um, w with whom the, the private sector can, can uniquely work. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to ask about um, is evidence-based practice versus innovation. So um, generally speaking, in the private sector, um, one of the, the arguments for its success is that um, it's kind of uh, less regulated, so it's more open to be able to innovate and to try new things that are maybe not tested or proven or have a huge um, or decades-long evidence base. And I sometimes see that um, with people on LinkedIn who might post about something they're doing, a model that they're using. I've never heard of it. I look it up. The evidence base is slim or completely absent. And I, I, I take very seriously the, the, the model of being a scientist practitioner. And so far, I might, I might change my mind. Um, but I, I, take, I take that as an obligation. And I, I think if, if I'm not being a, a scientist practitioner, I'm not being a clinical psychologist. Um, but on the flip side of that, <clears throat> is there an opportunity to try something which, although hasn't been proven, um, might have some evidence, but whereas it might not be commissioned by the NHS for that reason, um, there's, a, there's an opportunity there um, in the private sector to, to innovate and, and use new models and new ideas. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think there probably is. Um, it's not really something that I have done. I th I'd say I'm still a very similar clinician now than I was when I was employed. But, you know, there are people, um, for example, um, someone had on the podcast recently who were doing sort of ecotherapy and stuff outside the therapy room. And that's a really nice opportunity to bring in something of yourself, but also stuff that's that's got an emerging evidence base. But I think it gives you p freedom and permission to to be yourself and to to niche as well so you only have to work with the clients and the populations that you want to so I only work with over 17s really over 18s um, ideally for me working online only um, doesn't feel safe enough for working with children and young people so um, I've I'm now not working with any children's or family services um, which feels different because I, I, I did really love that years ago but um, I now feel that I am, e I do feel equally as competent in working with children and adults because of the length of time I've done both. But I would say I'm now a specialist adult clinician um, and uh, I kind of will see trauma, complex trauma, complex grief. Um, and that's, you know, I will do OCD because it's usually linked with complex trauma, but I wouldn't necessarily see myself as a as a specialist OCD clinician. But if there's complex trauma roots, then that often is um, something that I will do. Um, but I can say no to you know other bits and pieces that, that I don't think I'm the best clinician for. You know, whereas when you're in a team, you can't always do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um think from my from my limited time already I, I can see that there are particular um particular types of work that i i would prefer not to do if i if i could choose and that i'd rather put my energy into things that i guess the path of least resistance here's here's a here's a type of client a type of issue a type of way of working that just feels really good to me so um yeah that's that's um yeah it's like I could of, do that, but it will take mm. me a lot more and I will need to do lots of reading around that to do that. Um, or I could do what I'm already in my zone of um, zone of genius in, as they say in business terms, um, where actually things will come more freely to me and I will be more help to you as a clinician because I'm having to do less learning and scrabbling and kind of getting to where you need me to be you know when I when you're working with me 
in complex trauma, you want me to say, oh, actually, this is a really good example of that. And I wonder if this is happening, not me going, oh, right, how do we how do we work with pain again? Like, what's that approach? What's that thing? Oh, I don't know what I'm doing there. Like, you know, I wouldn't ever <laughs> I'm not gonna say to a client, I don't think I'm the best choice for you. This has turned out a bit different than we expected. And they might still say, I still want to work with you because I like you best. And it's like, well, you can make that informed choice, but I still I'm still regularly telling you, you know, this is largely pain work. I'm not much good at pain work. And they're still making that choice to work with me. That's their choice, you know? But I wouldn't generally go ahead picking up pain clients because I don't know I'm rubbish with pain <laughs> like personally you know I don't necessarily mean rubbish clinically but really difficult and and that said if anyone's watching painkiller on um on Netflix at the moment I've just finished it yesterday with my husband it's really really interesting and uh yeah useful watch as an aspiring or qualified psychologist thanks um I'm just I'm just aware of the, of the time that's um maybe slightly longer chat than than you usually have so I think maybe we should think about sort of moving to the end. Um, so I'm just going to ask you a kind of general, your general thoughts and, and views around um, the future. Um, maybe a general reflection, if, if you want to, on the future of clinical psychology in the private sector and the NHS. Um, if you want to get politicised about that, you can. Um, but maybe more specifically, um, the future of your yourself and and it can be a long career um and yeah um just yeah tell, tell us about what 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 you what you see in the future for for both of those things yeah I mean I can't ever really imagine not doing psychology so um I can't imagine retiring and not being a psychologist and I know that's not unusual as 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 a profession um because I feel like it's part of my identity you know I love being a psychologist um I love being Dr Marianne Trent actually it feels weird that I just wouldn't do that that I wouldn't and that I wouldn't continue to earn money in in some capacity because the state pension's not, not gonna be enough and I left the NHS too early to have a, a really well and I'm the wrong age to have a really nice NHS pension. And I have got a private pension, but I probably started that too late. Like, so I think many of us are going to need some sort of supplementary income. I don't own any properties to to rent out or anything. You know, that's not something we've gone down the route of. Um, but it's, it's interesting because what quickly became apparent when I first qualified is that the NHS training scheme is not a guarantee of employment and ordinarily there's jobs available but what we learned in 2011 is there's no guarantee of any NHS employment it doesn't lead to you know a band seven or preceptorship role there's not funding earmarked for paid qualified work just because you've been trained as a qualified psychologist and so I could potentially have moved into private work at that point but really I feel what is useful about band sevens roles is that you are able to to come up to full speed of being qualified which really full speed is 8a I would say um, that's traditionally how they were thought about you know two years of band seven and then preceptorship to 8a and certainly in my experience that's absolutely the case I've become a better and better clinician the longer and longer I've been qualified um, but in terms of the future of clinical psychology, it's really tricky. Um, I think some element of AI will come in and that will be sad for the profession and sad for the clients as well because connection with another human and being able to share things that you feel have deeply personal and private with someone where it feels safe and trusted to do that, honestly, it's just the biggest privilege um i i don't i don't know you know if if the funded nhs route will continue in this regard for for the foreseeable you know if we think about will this still be like this in 10 years how is it possible that 
counselling psychologists who largely are similarly qualified and experienced to ourselves are having to self-fund, you know, and forensics as well. Like, how is that okay? How has that been that there's only funding for educational and and cl and clinical that feels massively unjust so will it be that it will be leveled across the board or will it be that it will become self-funding you know you're starting to see more courses signing up to self-funding routes over the last couple of years um I don't know um I still feel like I've got the best job in the world you know that it allows me to do clinical work it allows me to do um you know I've got a TV series starting on Sunday it allows me to write for the media it in the Galway it allows me to stand on stage in Galway and talk to people who are equally passionate about mental health and the career of psychology and that is all because I did a psychology undergraduate degree you know that's what my um you know my key stakeholder benefit was to begin with that's allowed me to jump through all the hoops to get where I am to be sitting with you discussing my private career um why would you not want to do this job but um you know will it always exist like this I don't know is the answer yeah I suppose it's big yeah the, the, those are big elements aren't they um the, the future of the NHS <clears throat> which could go in one of two extreme uh, directions um um, has kind of ebbed and flowed the whole time that it's existed and continues to ebb and flow. Um, and yeah, the AI is coming over the hill um, real quick. Um, but um, yeah, I'm also interested by the AI idea as well. Wait to see uh, what impact that has. And, and yeah, uh, actually really have no idea. I guess that's probably about as much as we should uh, talk about. We've We've covered your journey out of Declin into NHS, out of NHS into a kind of blended situation, then into full time, covered some pros and cons, normative, formative, restorative, some big reflections as well in there. So I think we've we've done just about, um, covered just about everything that, that we could. Um, so that's been really interesting. I found it really interesting. So hopefully uh, everyone listening has found it really interesting as well. Um, so thanks for tuning in and listening and thank you for having me as the kind of uh, informal host for the day. Uh, it's been, yeah, it's been really fun. Um, also, as a, as a final note, um, we should mention that uh, Marianne has her uh, free compassionate Q&A uh, that you can access information about across all of her socials, which is Dr. Marianne Trent. Um, there are two sessions coming up. Uh, so the first one is Tuesday, the 3rd of October at 6 p.m. And the second one is Tuesday, the 7th of November, also at 6 p.m. So uh, check out um, Marianne's socials if you are interested in joining any of those. Which, which, uh, which I, I think, think um, just, just about wraps everything, everything up for today, today doesn't, doesn't it? it? So, so I, I should, I thank, should my thank my guest, Dr. Marianne, Dr. Marianne Trent, Trent uh, uh, who is also, also obviously... obviously the leader, the leader of this podcast, podcast. Um, and, and thank, thank, thank the, the listeners, listeners for uh, tuning in, in. and yeah, having a little listen to this kind of little role reversal, reversal and, uh, and, and finding, finding out uh, a bit more about, about um, Marianne's, Marianne's journey, journey herself, herself to, to this, this point. point. So, thanks, thanks Marianne. Marianne. How thank was you, it? Thomas. Okay? Thank you so much and for your bravery in, <laughs> in, in tackling me and suggesting this podcast episode. If anyone else has got any ideas for podcast episodes, please do feel free to let me know. Or if anyone wants Thomas to grill me on anything else, let me know. And I'm sure we can sort that out as well. But you are about to start your journey um, as a trainee. In fact, by the time this comes out, you will be in your teaching block. So I hope it goes so well for you. Thank you again for your time, Thomas. And thank you to our listeners for listening. If you're looking to become a psychologist, then let this be your guide. With this podcast at your side, you'll be on your way to being qualified. It's the Aspiring Psychologist Podcast with Dr. Marianne Trent.